Good evening. So this was a talk originally scheduled, originally submitted to PyCon for 45 minutes. So we're going to move pretty quickly, but you will understand what circumstances decorators are useful and approximately the things that you have to watch out for. This uh, is based on a blog post that I made at noclevercode.subtle.com and it has links and examples and code and stuff. So you can look forward, to, uh, look for more information there. So it's noclevercode.svbtle.com. So decorators are a way of, re of applying a certain behavior to Hmm. I'm going to do it by hand. Uh, applying a certain behavior to any number of functions or classes. So you can actually annotate an entire class with a decorator. But first, the mechanism to use decorators is using that at symbol on the line just before the definition of a function or the definition of a class. All that does is say the function name equals the decorator as a function being past the original definition. So you'll see that a function equals a decorator passed in a function. That means that what a function points to is no longer the code above. It is another function that we hope we'll call the original one. But that token in your program is now pointing to something else. That's all it means. And this all happens at definition time or compile time, whatever you want to call it. So when these things fail, they fail early, which I like. The mechanism itself is inconsistent and unintuitive. It's not you. It's not, some, it's not even really Python. It's how the user chose to call it. So when you're building advanced decorators that take parameters, they behave differently, not because you wrote them differently, but because the user passed in parameters. Even empty parentheses will trigger this behavior. So just be aware of that, that this mechanism is a little tricky and unintuitive. So decorators mean that a function or a class gets wrapped in something else. So this something else can be a function. It can be a class as well. But what do you do with it? Well, you have access to that function's call before and after. So you can do timing, you can do logging, you can do authorization, you can validate the parameters, you can validate the return value. You can do all these things by creating a decorator. And this decorator can be used anywhere. It's just a function, as long as the code has access to the function that you import, just like any other function. You can use that decorator on anything. You can even stack decorators. You can have more than one decorators affecting a definition, an object. So this would be a, talking about a function object. And they are objects. So this means that the timing decorator would wrap a function that is the logging decorator, which wraps do something. It doesn't often work that decorators stack well. Sometimes you have to try them one way or another. But they tend not to play well with each other. And if you get into understanding how they work, this metaprogramming, 
you'll, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious that some make assumptions about the function that they're wrapping and some don't. The other issue is that fu as functions are objects, they have attributes. And you can add any attribute you want to it, just like with a class instance or a class. But it has something called underscore, underscore, call, underscore, underscore. And that's the, the thing that makes it go. If your decorator annotates the function object or screws around with it, it probably won't work if it's not wrapping the function, but wrapping another decorator function. Because these things don't ripple up and down. This is simply a function that has code that does that. So the decorator gets called and gets passed in a pointer to the function you're, you defined underneath it. So now it defines a method, a function, a nested function that calls the original thing and returns the value. That's all it does. But it's kind of weird because you're saying, OK, I'm pointing in a, putting in a pointer to a function to a function. And OK, now that's how I do it. Now that inner function has access to the parameter because of the way Python works. It just has access to all its parents' variables. But when we return it, and remember, we're returning a function that says, call me, I'm Bob now. All that information remains. So that is the, that is the harsh truth of what decorators look like in the simple case. They wrap another thing, usually a function. As I said, you can wrap objects. And when you wrap the object, you can screw around with all of its accessors and mutators. And you can log every time they get called. And you can do all the work you want to do. The most complex one I've worked on so far is a deprecated de decorator that just says log it anytime somebody calls this function or creates this class. So in there, we go in and we say, great, I also want to know every time they get a method, they get a value off of an instance of the class. So if you want to, you can dive in there and hook, hook up proxies and control what that nested object gets to do. But in the simple case, this is a function. Because you have a function that's operating in place of another function, you can actually change its attributes so it really looks like what it's pretending to be. Name, doc, you can do anything you want. You can make it look like, you can make it have a good disguise. There's a decorator available from Funk Tools that does that for you. So that's the difference between that and this is that one decorator on the nested function that you're writing is it says, oh great, we're going to just make you, we're just going to put on the disguise or the disguise team. Most of the time, most code doesn't care about the attributes of a function, but some do. And this is a cheap way to just make sure. Just remember when you're debugging, you're now having two functions that have the same name. And that's okay, just you have to remember that. Also with naming, with annotations, we tend to expect it to say at sign, lowercase, 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 lowercase. And for functions, this is fine. But if you're, creating, if you're using a class, like we are here, to be the decorator, it needs to have that kind of name, otherwise it'll look weird. But classes are supposed to have correct case names. And Flake 8 will yell at you. So I just you know, put in a little flag that says, trust me, I don't, don't look at this line. It's all good. So this is an example of how a class wraps a function. The class initializer gets the function and stores it in an instance variable. And the call method that all classes have acts as the wrapper itself. 
So every time you say Fred parentheses, it calls the, call, the underscore underscore call method. And the result is, and this is just showing how you could do like a dorky cache thing. If it's in the cache, use that. If it's not in the cache, then call your wrapped function to get the real value and put it in the cache. So you don't necessarily actually have to call the wrapped function. You just have to behave as if the user had called the wrapped function. Now I told you about those two modes. And the only difference between those two modes is what the, the user writes down in the decorator. If they have parentheses, it's going to be mode two. And there, it's just a more complicated metaprogramming thing. As I said, this is all in that blog post. And that gives you examples, and it shows you how you do it. But basically, you call something, it returns something that that the, de the decorator mechanism immediately calls to get the wrapper. Um, it's the only way to get parameters into decorators. So be aware there's stuff like this happening. Here's where I say that again. You can write a decorator that can handle Either way, it's hard, it's very hard, but you can do it. And the blog post has an example of that. Basically, your, your methods have to say, okay, did you just pass me parameters or did you just pass me a function to wrap? And you say, great, if you pass me this, I'm gonna do this. If not, I'll do that. And it's a, it's a lot of work. For most decorators, you can just say, don't call me with parameters. If you do, I'll break. Remember, you're going to break at define time, not at runtime. So that's, I don't know, I like that. But, you know, I still get teased for coming from Pascal. So the, the digression is when I was writing this, I found that classes, actual classes, Instance of classes and functions all have a lot in common. They have attributes, and that means you can just set any attribute you want on there. It's a dictionary. And when you call them, that is to say, put their name with parentheses after them, something happens. With a class, you get a, construct, you get a new instance of that class. With instances, you call the call method. It should be under bar, under bar call method. Sorry about that. And with functions, it also has a call method. But basically, it runs. So when you're wrapping a function with a class or a class with a function, you can return a thing, an object, that behaves the same way, even though it's not the object that you think it is. Now, remember, we can copy attributes all we want. It can, it can have the same name. But in fact, if you do an is instance, <clears throat> you could be very surprised. But the point is, you shouldn't care. This isn't a statically typed language, even though it will be. This is a language where we don't depend so much on interfaces as on, can this thing, whatever it is, do what I need it to do? Does it have this method? Great, go. So rather than saying it must fit this pattern, we can just say, is it going to do what I need it to do here at this point in time? Because you can add methods to, to classes after they've been instantiated. Scary but true. Ruby does it all the time. Look what it gets them. So that is the digression is that I found that in Python, objects is objects. And they, they have a lot more in common than they have differences. It's how we use them. I left time for questions. 
So does anybody have questions about decorators, what they can do, what you want to do with them? Or decorators that you've seen that you don't understand? Yes, sir. What happens is... Can you repeat the question, please? The question was, I import a function, and then I say, at, at function, and then oh, you know, the next thing is a def. What happens is this. This equals a function equals a decorator, and you pass in the function, the defined function, as a parameter. That is literally all that, ha all that mechanically happens at this point. Now, that decorator needs to do something with that function. It needs to return something. Now, a decorator could say, I'm just going to log the fact that this function exists, and I'm going to return it. I'm not going to wrap it. I'm just going to return it. Perfectly reasonable thing for a decorator to do. It doesn't have to wrap it if it doesn't want to. Theoretically, it could do something else where it returned. I mean, you could return an int. At that point, that token is now pointing at an int and will probably be a disappointment. So this is all very simple tools to achieve a, a very subtle end. And if you do it wrong, the tools will still work. The, the mechanism will still function. But what you're left with on the other side is not what you want it to be. So you have to go in and do this part, where you say, great, you've given me a function. I'm going to write another function that will take its place and almost always will call the original at some point. So we'll do like two questions, and then we'll wrap it up sure. so that way we can have questions for everybody. Sure. Have you found that uh, decorator is useful for doing error handling? It's a little, uh, the question was, are decorators useful for error handling? I, I would not eat exceptions in a decorator, because you really don't know where, what the context is going to be. Uh, if you want to log them, absolutely. You can you know, ca you know, catch the exception on the way out, log it, and re-raise it. Uh, but I would not eat exceptions there. But anything you, but you could also look at the return value. Is it valid JSON? Is it, you know, is it too long that I can't, I, I don't want to do responses that are this long? You can do anything you want. You can have very specific decorators that handle very few functions, and you can have generic ones that can basically be used anywhere. Yes, ma'am. What's, um, what are some, like, decorator anti patterns? Uh, eating exceptions. Um, there's one with that, that runs the function in threads, um, which makes it really weird because what comes back doesn't come back until later, and you have to set up a, 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 a completion handler. I, I don't think that's a very good use for uh, decorators. For most logging, um, there's generally, you know, on any sort of high volume site, you, you're going to want to use something else. You're going to want to use one of the, you know, high volume solutions that has a asynchronous log, so you're not slowing down the call. There's a lot of stuff like that where, it's, uh, I mean, it's not. It's it's basically if you were going to write the code in the function over and over and over again, a decorator is a good way to kind of pull it out and make it transportable. Um, but you know, as you work with them, you'll, you can see, oh, yeah, you really don't want to be doing that because that could take forever. And now, and now your call is slowed down. 